I think I've told you before about how in my preordained life, I used to go on Sunday afternoons to an Alzheimer's unit called the Arbors with a Caribbean lady who by that time was already over the age of 90. We were going to minister to people who were considerably younger than she was. And she had very strong opinions about what we were going to say, what prayers and what songs we were going to sing. As an aside, I should say that I learned the one that we sang at the beginning today by going to the Arbors with Sicily. And it still has memories for me of those days. As much of the time she and I were singing just the two of us and were, were saying the prayers just the two of us because our congregation, for the most part, were, were so far into dementia that they couldn't remember the words, they couldn't read them on the song sheets that we handed out. But once in a while, just once in a while, she chose something that sparked in people's minds and they remembered it and they were able to say it. And then the whole room came alive all of a sudden with all of these people. And the 23rd Psalm was one of those things. It's one of those things that we have inscribed on our hearts. We, we, have, we know it by heart. We say it again and again as we go through our lives in times of trouble or times of sorrow, uh, times of confusion. And so it's perhaps one thing that sticks with us. But I wonder how often we unpack it and try to figure out what it's actually saying and what it may mean, these words of, of this little poem that we repeat to ourselves. What I'd like to do this morning is unpack the psalm and see perhaps what it is saying to us, what God is saying to us, and so what we are saying when we repeat it. So that maybe the next time you do, whether it's in private or in public, in a time of sorrow, whether it's on your lips or on your heart, there'll be something there that reminds you of what it is that you're saying. And so we begin, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. I think if we are honest, dear friends, we know most of the time who we want our shepherd to be, and that is ourselves. We know what decisions we need to make for ourselves. We know what being an individual who is in charge and accountable for his or her life means. We know what our goals are. We know what our ambitions are. We know how to run our lives until the crises come, until we begin to recognize the limitations of the things that we think of as our goals in the face of what it is that God desires for each one of us. At some point, I think each one of us begins to realize that the fame and fortune and popularity and beauty and notoriety and security that each of us desires that we imagine being the things that we're making choices about are really just pale reflections of the grace and mercy and love and forgiveness of God, which are the things that we truly desire, the things that make our lives truly meaningful as full children of God. And so it is that we recognize that being our own shepherd doesn't work all that well when it comes to being complete souls. Now, we should be clear that there are plenty of other would-be shepherds out there also. There are plenty of people who would like to tell us how to run our lives. Just go on the internet and you will find lots and lots of people who will tell you how to be rich, how to be popular, how to be fill-in-the-blank, anything else you might want, and they'll sell you a way to do it while they're at it. Trouble is, most of those other shepherds fall away also whenever trouble comes, whenever doubt and uncertainty come. They don't really have a whole lot to offer. Once again, it are, is the things that we desire truly from God, the things that only God can provide that define for us who our shepherd truly is. And for that reason, we have a better understanding of what it means to not be in want. You and I are pretty good at saying, I want this, I want that, I want the other thing. We do it all the time. The danger is that if we do it long enough, we'll come to see those things that we want as things that we absolutely cannot live without, the fundamental things of life. Once again, it is only once we recognize who our shepherd is that we see that the things that we want are only imperfect symbols for the things that we truly need, the things that only God can provide. So once again, love, mercy, grace, forgiveness are the things that will sustain us and the things that if we will find our true shepherd, we will never lack. Moving on, 
He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. The great reformer of the Protestant church, John Calvin, wrote a commentary on the 23rd Psalm in which he pointed out that sheep don't like to drink from moving water. I don't know how Calvin knew that. I certainly didn't know it, at least until now. But it kind of makes sense if you think about it. In our modern jargon, we talk about trying to drink from a fire hose. If whatever is going by is going by too quickly, it's difficult for us to get any benefit from it. It's hard for us even to process what's going on in our lives if it's all coming at us so quickly that we're unable to to sort it out and decide what in it is really of value, what we should be holding on to, what direction we should go. I think what we're being told is that God, the shepherd, leads us at a pace that we can manage. I may have told you before that that there's a difference between cows and sheep. Cows have to be driven. You get behind the cow, you make a noise, the cow is scared just enough to run away, and you direct the cow which way to go. Sheep want to be led. The shepherd is in front of the sheep, and the sheep who know and love the shepherd will follow. Well, if the shepherd is way far out in front of the sheep, it's going to be difficult for the shepherd to come back in time if the wolf appears. All the more reason why it's important to be leading the sheep at a pace that the sheep can manage. You may know the expression, God will never give us more than we can handle. Some people will say it's true. Some people will say it's false. I suspect each of us have had experiences of both at one time or another in our lives. But I think what we're being told is that God at least understands our nature, our creativeness, and will lead us at a pace that God knows we can manage. Adding in, perhaps the leavening, that the Holy Spirit also comes and stirs us up from time to time and may possibly speed us up even when we're not quite ready for it, even when that isn't necessarily quite what we want. Nonetheless, we are led by a shepherd who understands us. He revives my soul and leads me along right pathways for his name's sake. We all come to be known in some way by our name. I don't just mean literally John or Mary, but if John the builder, Mary the attorney, um, or the person who always does all the work in the kitchen, or the person who is never on time, one way or another, whatever name is applied to us becomes the name that we're known by and are known for. God's name is also God's reputation, and God's reputation is glory. So if we are led for God's name's sake, it is for the greater glory of God. And that, by extension, dear friends, means that everything that we do is intended to be for the glory of God. Imagine that for a moment. The next time we're thinking, well, it's good enough. We'll fix it next time. It's just us. No. It should worry us just a little bit that absolutely everything we do as faithful followers of Jesus is meant to contribute to the reputation of God in the world and so to the glory of God. How wonderful and yet how worrying. Have you thought about what you've done already today and how it has glorified God? Have you thought about what you're going to do for the rest of today and how it will glorify God? It's a crude modern way of putting it, but to say that the return on God's investment in us is glory is to show how much work we have to do, and yet how wonderful it is that even the smallest act that is compassionate or merciful or kind or forgiving or compassionate or justice-bringing, must be a better word than justice-bringing, but you know what I mean, is for the glory of God and will be received in that way. What a wonderful thing. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. 
I once took a youth group trip to Ireland. And because it was Ireland, there was a farm down the road from where we were staying. And because it was Ireland and a farm, of course, there were sheep. And as I walked by one day, there was a, a crowd of sheep down at the bottom of the hill. But there was one sheep who had managed to walk up to the top of the hill, who was looking down at the others and was in great distress because he couldn't figure out how to get back to them. Now, it was not like it was a complicated puzzle. All he had to do was walk back in the way that he had come. But in that moment, he couldn't quite figure it out. He had wandered into a place he didn't really intend to go. He had no reason to be separated from the flock. But he didn't quite know what to do next. I think that happens to you and to me also as we go through our lives, doesn't it? We find ourselves in those places that perhaps we never really intended to get into. And yet there we are. What a blessing to know that God is with us even in those places, those unintentional, undesirable places that we wander in our lives. Now, it's good to begin from what the psalm is talking about, the, the truly darkest places of our lives, despair and death. But if we look at the words, there, there's more to it than that. I mean, you may know that in Hebrew, words only have consonants. There are no vowels. So the way a word is pronounced in Hebrew is defined by additional marks that are made above and below the consonants. So with very small changes in the marks that are made around the word that's used for the valley of the shadow of death, it could be translated instead as the valley of dark shadows or the valley of dark places. That broadens the, the scope considerably to any and every place that we may find ourselves, places of confusion, places of doubt, places of despair, of, of, of a lesser sort. What do I do next? Where do I go? What am I supposed to be doing? The idea that God is beside us in all those places, and not merely beside us, but God is in front of us in those places because God has already gone to those places. What a wonderful image to know that God will, there is no place we can go where God will not be. There is no place that we go that God does not go beside us. And we have God's rod and God's staff to comfort us in those times. You may have seen pictures or movies of, of ballet classes. You may be a ballet dancer for all I know. You may know that, that it's common in ballet classes for the teacher to have a big staff. That's partly so that that, that that person can have some balance when trying to demonstrate a position for the, that he or she wants the class to do. But it also can be used for other purposes. The staff can be held out to show when the dancers are not in a straight line. It can be held up to show when a dancer's back is not straight. God's rod and God's staff comfort us by reminding us of what it means to have a straight spiritual back. That is comforting, although also troubling, I think. If we're honest with ourselves, there are times when we kind of get to like those twisted positions we get ourselves into, the curves of our back, the straight lines that aren't quite so straight in our lives. The rod and staff of God are not intended to beat us into submission or beat us back into the right way, but they're intended to show us when we have gotten out of line when our sin and our defiance of God have led us away from the path that God desires. And how wonderful to know that we have a way to judge that, that God will not give us up, God will not say, I'm done with you, but will continue to remind us of, what's God, of what God's vision is for us. You spread a table before me in the presence of those who trouble me, You've anointed my head with oil. My cup is running over. It seems that in World War II, this was a very popular verse in London during the Blitz. People who were hiding for safety in basements and subway stations and bomb shelters would repeat this because, in fact, danger that those who troubled them, which is a very weak way of saying enemies and, and those who would harm me, had come right to their literal doorstep. Bombs were dropping around them. And here was a reminder of God's presence. Not 
you noticed that God would come and remove them from the danger to some safe and secure place, but rather that even in the midst of danger, even in the middle of the peril, God was present and was providing for them. This is what you and I receive every week when we come to the Eucharist. We who are surrounded always by the world, that may be a little bit difficult to imagine in in the placid suburbs of Delaware, but imagine for a moment if you were coming to the Eucharist this morning in Gaza or Ukraine or Haiti or Mali or a hundred other places, the, the ones that particularly convict us are the ones that I can't name because we don't know about them. There are plenty of places where receiving what is spread on the table in the presence of danger is very real and very present. I had one small experience of this. One Ash Wednesday, I found myself in Cairo. I didn't just literally find myself in Cairo. I was in Cairo on Ash Wednesday. And I went to the Anglican Cathedral, but they were not having a service there. They had moved their service to one of the oldest remaining Christian churches in the world called Abu Sarga. It's in an old neighborhood of old Cairo. And it gave us a sense of what the situation was and what we needed to think about that while we were having church in the middle of this this ancient, ancient building, there were Egyptian soldiers with automatic weapons walking around the perimeter of the church the whole time even in the middle of the danger from which they were supposed to protect us and presumably would have. Thankfully, nothing happened. We were there receiving from God what God would pour out for each one of us. And indeed, it is poured out. It isn't simply put down neatly in a little pile on the table, and that's all there is to it. It flows out in every direction, out of the cup, onto the table, off the table, onto the floor, out the doors of the place, wherever the place is. Surely what we receive here must go out with us into the world. We who have received must in turn bestow. So if we are told that our cup is flowing over, it isn't an accident, it isn't a mistake, it isn't meant to be cleaned up. It's a very strong signal to share. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The Old Testament scholar Ralph Ralph Jacobson has pointed out that follow is not a good translation of the Hebrew word that was used in the psalm here. The word is better translated as pursue or chase. What a lovely image that is, that somehow these, these goods that God desires for us will come after us all the time. Whenever we are, wherever we are, we will find them close by, God desiring to bestow them on us again. When we are fleeing from whatever we fear, if we look behind us and expect to see our enemies, what we will find instead are goodness and mercy chasing us down, hunting us down, unwilling to give up on us. You and I, who are the sheep, who have been given everything that the shepherd has to offer, everything that we could possibly ask, are told that goodness and mercy will come and dwell with us, never leave us alone, never desert us, and that in the end, we will dwell in the house of God forever. The shepherd who guides us, who leads us, who protects us, in dangerous places, who provides more than we could possibly use or need or ask for, will take us to dwell with God's self eternally. That, dear friends, is enough to unpack the psalm for a day or two, I think. I hope the next time it comes up, the next time it is on your lips, the next time it is in your heart, some of this will come back. You'll recognize all that we have been given. Amen.